Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome you to this online discussion dubbed What's Next? Post-UK General Election, where we're going to reflect for the next hour or so on the outcomes and the intrigue from the elections that took place last week in our nearest neighbour in the United Kingdom. I'm really thrilled to be joined by two experts in their fields, Dr. Tim Oliver and Dr. Lisa Claire Witten, who I will introduce uh, formally in a moment. But just to say on behalf of the Institute and everybody on the call, how happy I am that you took the time out to be with us. So the format for this discussion is going to uh, differ a little bit from our, our typical lunchtime seminars, but not too far that rather than asking Tim and Lisa to deliver a 10 to 15 minute stump speech, uh, as interesting as that would be, we're just going to head straight into more of a back and forth bet between the three of us. So we have a couple of questions just to, just to try and delve into a little bit what happened last week. And indeed, in keeping with the branding of this, this event, what happens next, what this might mean for the peoples of the UK and indeed for its neighbourhood. Mm -hmm. The usual uh, uh, rules and details apply. Uh, this event is on the record. If you wish to participate by asking a question, please do so using the uh, Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And if you wish to participate in the discussion online, you can use the Twitter X uh, handle at IIEA. So I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers. Dr. Tim Oliver is a leading expert on Brexit, UK politics and foreign policy and international relations. Dr. Oliver holds a PhD from the LSE, uh, which looked at the nature of the UK state and how it makes foreign policy. Tim was a senior lecturer in the Department of Defence and International Affairs at the Royal uh, Military Academy Sandhurst. And he was also a transatlantic postdoctoral fellow for international relations and security, TAPIR based at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik in Berlin, the Centre for Transatlantic Relations at John Hopkins University, School of Advanced International Studies, and the RAND Corporation in Washington, D.C. Tim, great to have you here, albeit digitally. Dr. Lisa Claire Witten is uh, also known to many of you and is known to the Institute. Uh, Dr. Witten is a research fellow at Queen's University Belfast, specialising in the legal, regulatory and constitutional implications of Brexit, particularly looking at Northern Ireland. Prior to entering academia, Lisa Clare held a variety of posts in the public sector, including working for an MP in Westminster and at the office of the Northern Ireland Executive in Brussels. Lisa Clare has recently published two books, both on the subject of the Northern Ireland Constitution, entitled Northern Ireland and the UK Constitution and Brexit and the Northern Ireland Constitution. Are they both with Oxford? The second one is with Oxford. The First one you mentioned is House Publishing, and it's a shorter read. I wouldn't recommend anyone really goes for the OUP. Yeah. <laughs> but I should um, say that's that. great. <laughs> cool. But congratulations. There are two great citations. I'm going to start now, if I may, by uh, turning first of all to Tim. And Tim, predictably, I'd like to ask, uh, first of all, where were you last Thursday when you watched the election results? Were you any anywhere interesting, J just at home, or were you at work, or where? I was at the LSE's election night, which they host every election. I've been to quite a few now, given the last few years um, and, and referendums. So, yeah, I was at the LSE um, listening to their takes on the on the night. Although I didn't, I didn't before, stay at <laughs> before, yeah, I think we all, I'm sure many people on the call and, and, and you two as well had to make the call whether you're going to stay up or not. And just out of sheer habit, I decided to stay up, but it was not as exciting as any previous election <laughs> that I can recall. But before asking you, Tim, if there are any main takeaways, then I'll turn to Lisa and ask the same question. Can you just describe the the atmos in the atmosphere in the in the in the LSE? Was there anything particularly notable, or was it because of the predictable nature of the results? Was it kind of flatter than you might have expected? Okay, one thing I noticed. Um, I turned around to watch to watch the crowd while also watching the the screen when the exit poll came up, um, and I noticed a large number of people had their cameras up to try and film the reaction of the crowd because they were expecting some form of big kind of like, ooh, or big screams or lots of yells of delight. And actually it was quite more muted. Now everybody was not surprised at the big scale of the result, but there wasn't the enthusiasm, shall we say, or the delight and the screams of joy 
that some might associate with the LSE, given its more left-wing reputation, although that's unfair. Yeah. The LSE also has a very right-wing reputation as well. Um, and I think that connects to my first, my first big first observation about the result, which is while there was a strong degree of anger and contempt at the Tory party, there wasn't the matching enthusiasm for the mm -hmm. Labour party, shall we say. Um, and I saw that firsthand um, at the LSE's election night. Mm -hmm. It's been said uh, a couple of times, um, I've heard that this wasn't necessarily an election that Labour won, but in fact, it was an election that the Tories lost. I think that's a little bit unfair because there was some really impressive vote management with the Labour vote share yes. across the United Kingdom. But do you have any, any anything to say about that uh, contention? Yes, that's right. Labour ran a much more focused campaign, just like the other big winner of the night, which was the Liberal Democrats, who were very ruthless in focusing their resources on a certain number of campaigns and hang out with having their lead, leader, Ed Davey, run a national campaign with lots of kind of stunts. Um, Labour were much more ruthless, which you can see in just the share of the vote didn't actually change that much, mm. but the seats they won did. So yes, they, well, what should we say that the Labour didn't necessarily have to do um, as much in terms of kind of really pushing themselves out there to, to lots of loading voters like you might have in the past, because the Conservatives made such a mess of themselves and the really been kind of um, struggling in the polls now for the past two years. Um, Labour therefore carried that, the Ming Bar strategy is called. That's not easy to give them credit. Plus they also have shown over the last few years that they're a much more disciplined, effective party. Starmer has brought discipline, whether or not you like that or not, some of the people on the left of the Labour Party especially are not happy with this, but he seems to have brought discipline and order that has made the party look like it's a functioning party of government rather than a party of opposition that will just say things just to score points. So that's not easy. But again, that hasn't generated the level of enthusiasm and delight that, say, we were expecting on a par with, say, 1997 or even 1945, when the last times that we've seen big Labour um, landslides. That doesn't mean, however, that as we move forward, a lot of people will say to themselves or start thinking, oh, I voted for the Labour Party, I voted for you know, for that landslide, when in fact they didn't and they weren't as enthusiastic. So perhaps with time, things, people yeah. might sympathise a bit more with it. But that that thrill that you might have seen, that I remember as a, as a teenager from 1997, wasn't quite there. Indeed. And we are, we're it's always to be handled with care. We're talking in the, the white heat of post uh post-election so it's fun to talk about it but it's also very useful Tim to think about that what the next weeks months years may in fact mean mm -hmm. I'll come back to you on some other takeaways in a second but to put the same question to you Lisa Clare if you mm -hmm. don't mind my asking where were you watching the results was it just at home like I was or did you attend any kind of a event or gathering it was just at home on this occasion and uh listened long enough to get the exit poll and then did a very early wake up um to catch up on all of the events of the night was my strategy this time and given so you were you were in in in, in Belfast where your vote is in Belfast, um, yes. any any kind of major takeaways that you might like to share from, from that part of the world to, to complement or indeed challenge anything that Tim has shared mm. um I would say definitely compliment um overall picture and then I'll use this to uh, jump into the NI specifics I think you could frame this election to an extent as failure of incumbents so the Conservative Party just, as we've just been discussing, that real sense of their loss um, amid a Labour gain, but nonetheless, and the same goes for the SNP in Scotland, and um, that sort of real hit to the incumbents um, and their specific circumstances that apply there as well. But in the Northern Ireland setting then, um, while it's not as clear cut because Northern Ireland is as ever uh, structured somewhat differently and you essentially have two electoral um, blocks traditionally, a rising middle, but in the DUP setting, that sense of incumbents losing out um, is quite strong and clear. Uh, the DUP losing three seats to three different um, opposition, uh, uh, opposition parties and independents. And then on the other side of the coin, which is the other side of the split, you had a quite a clear win for Sinn Féin in that they held all of their seats um, with vote share increases. Um, so it's it's a mixed picture for Northern Ireland in general. There's kind of something for everyone. 
Um, we can get into the details. We had a couple of shock losses um, and transfers, but overall the picture is bad night for DUP, good night for Sinn Féin, splitting of unionism and the Alliance Party sort of holding where they are. Um, we can get into the... I, I could talk on... Yeah, and, and I think we will, but just... The three that the that the that the DUP lost to, I'm, I'm holding mm. myself to ransom here, but there was there was Jim Allister, there was the UUP, and there was the Alliance. That how it went. The UUP and the Independent, Alex Easton. Oh, so Easton. Robin Swan. Oh, DUP losses. Sorry. Um, yeah. this is yeah. So Alliance Sorcha Eastwood, um, Robin Swan yeah. of the UUP and Jim Allister of the TUV. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I, I observed that because <laughs> the um, typically the story is the left is fragmented and the right can consolidate. And obviously it's, it's not as clear cut or as simple to, to map that on top of unionism and nationalism, republicanism. But it is it just strikes me how the vote of Sinn Féin and the SCLP seem to have consolidated or at least held whereas political unionism is, is splitting. And that's we understand that from familiarity with the politics of the island, but it just kind of departs, interestingly, from what tends to happen in other, in other European countries. I'll go back to Tim quickly. Um, Tim, do, do you have anything to say there about, for example, Scotland or Wales that kind of strikes you as, as, as interesting or, or surprising? In some respects, and this came up in our previous discussions, there weren't that many surprises in this election, which makes it a little bit tougher to talk about. But if there were surprises, perhaps it was in those corners of the UK. Do you have anything to say about Wales or Scotland? Um, with regard to, um, first of all, Northern Ireland as well. Um, mm -hmm. Before the call, we were talking about this, about um, about how what happened in Northern Ireland and how that hasn't really registered in the rest of the UK yet, shall we say, to the same extent as you know, it might have registered in the Irish Republic. Um, nor, to some extent, what's happened to the SNP in Scotland. So have people in England noticed that the SNP were one of the biggest losers of the other night? Again, that hasn't necessarily worked its way through um, to British politics yet. It might, when Parliament starts sitting, we hear a lot less from the SNP, more from the Lib Dems and Reform and Green and so forth. But the SNP's losses didn't really register as, or haven't registered as, as loudly, partly because the Conservative Party have, have taken all the, the attention of, in terms of their, their losses. Um, and with regard to Wales, um, the only thing that has popped up this time is that the Conservatives have no MPs now in Wales. They still have MPs in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's, there's that dynamic, again, because of the electoral system playing out the way it is, um, that things in Scotland and Wales look a little differently. But within England and English politics within the United Kingdom, the story has been very much Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrat and reforms in Greens. What's been going on in Scotland hasn't really caught that much attention, although it helps the Labour Party, although it hasn't, you know, it hasn't been essential for the, for the Labour Party to win this majority this time. I have picked that up as well a little bit just from my obsessive consumption of, of British news. I think you're right about the, the major change in Scotland not being... Yeah as fully registered as it might have done. Is it purely down to the the collapse of the Tory vote that has kind of taken attention away from it? Or is there anything else you could put your you could put your part, finger on? Part of it might be um, in the past, the SNP or the possibility of the SNP succeeding has been used, especially by the Conservative Party to label, well, to, to accuse, the, to target the Labour Party with, you're going to be um, beholden to the SNP's vote. With that disappearing, it's not an issue anymore. Labour are doing. Labour have a secure, stable majority. They're not going to be beholden to the DUP, the SNP, or anybody else, or even reform. Um, so the idea of these small parties from other parts of the United Kingdom now having a, a kind of a large part in British politics through Westminster that's gone to the side. So it's not an issue at the moment. Um, what will come back, of course, is the investigation into what's happening at the SNP or has happened in the SNP because of its finances. That corruption story will come up again over the next yeah. year. Um, and of course, as anyone who studies Scotland knows, and as the SNP have been pointing out, support for independence hasn't necessarily gone away. So mm -hmm. while the SNP might have collapsed, so the possibility of Scotland being a constitutional issue has certainly not receded, although for this parliament, it will be very difficult to see it coming back as the SNP try to work out what to do next. Mm -hmm. And if, if I... there's... Please, please, Lisa, I was about to invite you in, please. Uh, just... Uh... 
by way of follow up on that, I think there's something interesting to be said about the new discrepancy between the political representation for Scotland in particular, but this goes across the board at devolved level versus those who represent um, that part of the UK on the green benches in Westminster and how the Labour Party in particular navigates that. Um, we haven't seen in a long time for uh, decades, we haven't seen the Labour Party having to be both the Labour Party in Scotland and the Labour Party um, in Westminster in the government. And that central devolved axis over the last few years has been one of real controversy and division, um, not least in the context of Brexit and returning powers. And there's a lot of tricky issues that are both technical and highly politicised that the new Stormer government are, is going to have to navigate and to do so in a way that is now in the context of devolved um, representation still being in that very SNP dominated um, context. And the even the Welsh government under Labour over the last few years have become more um, vocal and perhaps forthright in articulating a Welsh view. And then you also, of course, have the Northern Ireland particularities and um, how that plays out in terms of constitutional picture, any talk of reform or restructuring of intergovernmental relations is it's, it's a big topic area um, amidst a long to-do list for the new government, but one that's of interest, I think. Now we're talking. This is the sort of stuff. Please, Tim, I was going to ask if you might have anything to add, Tim, regarding, well, well, I should add, even, though, even if question. the SNP's position or, or lack of success the other night hasn't gone really registered, where has Starmer's first visit been to? It's been to Edinburgh and then Cardiff, and today he's hosted all the metro mayors from London and Manchester and so forth. So he's more than aware of the governance issues of this, even if the politics has not necessarily cut through. Um, going forward, Labour has... has having created in 19, from 1997 onwards, the devolved system of government that we have, have in the United Kingdom is for the first time coming back into government and facing the realities of this bedded in system. And let's not forget when it did set this up back in 97, there was a degree of, well, can we let go of the control? Can we let these devolved governments do their own thing? Whether it was in mayor with the mayor, with Ken Livingston or, or in Scotland or Wales, there was a lot of pushback. So that's something Starmer is going to have to struggle with over the next few years. Um, because Labour will want to do things from the centre, just like any government does. You absolutely preempted the question I wanted to put you, Tim. And what I was saying to Lisa is this is exactly what I was hoping these kind of the, the drift these conversations would take. So trying to think of the big thorny questions that people like ourselves will be puzzling over and people in power will be trying to solve. Uh, your expertise, well, one of your expertise, Tim, pertains to England and its politics. C can you say anything about what you think is going to happen regarding the... Metro mayors, many of whom are from the Labour Party and this new Labour government. Is this something that's going to, um, I don't know, um, is it easier the fact that uh, there's a Labour government than Westminster or does it add an extra level of complexity? Um, well, let's not forget that um, in some respects, the devol devolution within England, let's call it that, even if it's not devolution on a par with Scotland, Wales and, and what's happening in Northern Ireland, um, has been pushed mainly by the Conservatives since 2010. If you think about the big Metro mayors and so forth, this has actually been a Tory initiative to push that in a much bigger way. So Labour inherits that politically and also in terms of governance. It is going to pose problems. Um, these mayors are much more powerful political figureheads, even if they don't have the money um, that you might have in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, to some extent. Um, that's going to be it's going to cause problems. We're going to have elections for those mayors in the next couple of years, as always, um, just like in Scotland. You can see the potential there for pushback. Um, from these mayors, such as Andy Burnham, who do level sometimes in picking fights for obvious reasons that they want to represent Manchester versus central government. Sadiq Khan has struggled with this, of distinguishing. It's not I, one of my little bugbears is when people talk about London, forgetting that London is a city of almost nine million people with a mayor and a political system itself and doesn't represent, isn't represented necessarily by Westminster um, and of, often gets a bit of a hard time. Um, from Westminster, even if London is one of the beneficiaries often of, of UK politics. So there is going to be pushback from these mayors. Um, there's also the potential, of course, in England, but also elsewhere, that reform and the Green Party are going to make quite some pro some further progress over the next few years. The Lib Dems especially, 
The Conservatives as well, will they start to rebuild themselves through these metro mayors, through local government and so forth? That's one of the few ways back that they'll have. What message they're going to send, <laughs> God knows at the moment. I mean, the Conservative Party um, doesn't know how to stand up at the moment, let alone how to walk forward um, with its policy proposals. But yes, within English politics, we're going to see a lot more variation compared to when Labour came to power in 1997. There are a lot of questions coming in from the audience. I'd encourage you to anyone on, on the call to put in your questions. We'll get through as many of them as we can. Uh, before that, I want to put maybe one or two topics each to, to to our two speakers, and then we can move through some of the questions and raise some other topics as we go along. I'm going to put something to you, Tim, about what you just mentioned there about reform in the Greens. Lisa Clare, I would like to ask a couple of specific questions about, about Northern Ireland and what you anticipate the relations between the executive and Westminster will be now in this kind of, now that the, the noise and clutter of the election is out of the way, what that might might mean for the North and its peoples. And then to, to both of you, perhaps, um, if you have any thoughts on the UK's foreign policy now, and indeed just the, the, the shape of the new cabinet. So lots of really big topics there, but let's do our best. And then we'll move to the uh, questions that are coming in. So Tim, on... You know, to, for, for politics watchers, and I know this speaking to to peers in other European countries, one of the most um, interesting manifestations from this election is the arrival of the Reform Party with their five MPs um, and indeed the Greens doubling their representation. Um, the electoral system in the UK is so radically different to the one we have in Ireland. I always say uh, something I often talk about is our political cultures. There are so many similarities from my having spent time in both but the most obvious difference in how politics happens and indeed how democracy happens is how different the electoral systems are. Ours being a proportional system, the UK is being, at least at the general election level, being um, first past the post. Can you say anything, first of all, just about, about that fact, about the electoral system and how it's translated into, into seats and the mm -hmm. um, relative underrepresentation of some parties vis-a-vis their, vis -vis their vote share? And also... The arrival of these of, of of reform and perhaps a more kind of um confident Green Party, what that might mean for the politics in Westminster. I'll put the same questions to you, Lisa Claire, afterwards. Um this was a very disproportionate result by ele even British election standards, and working out how the electoral system would deliver a certain result confounded the pollsters, shall we say. The pollsters were not entirely accurate this time. They projected a landslide, but working out what was going to happen on the ground because of the constituency system and the first past the post, meant that actually a lot of the polling was pretty inaccurate um, to some extent. They correctly projected some tactical voting, but the way that we run elections in this country, it, it is, you know, I'll hold my hands up and say that I, I have long supported electoral reform. It is frustrating to see a situation in which the Labour Party barely moves its share of the vote, wins a landslide. The Liberal Democrats now have um, on 12% of the vote, I think they have 11% of the seats. They're now the party that accurately has the right number of seats in the House of Commons of all the party. Reform, yes, securing a bigger proportion of the vote than the Liberal Democrats and getting just five MPs. The Greens doing better, but getting four MPs. Um, and then the Conservatives not collapsing as badly as people thought they would. There was a real possibility, according to some pollsters, that we could have had in, ended up with a situation where the Liberal Democrats had the second largest share of the um, share of seats on the fourth largest share of the vote. Um, and that's not come to pass, but the electoral system has delivered something that's very strange. That happens in every election, let's not forget. The electoral system has always made the UK, or well, for a long time, appear more disunited, with the SNP dominating in Scotland, despite not winning you know, 100% of the votes that the Conservatives never seem to do well in the North, apparently, and Labour in the South has always been that division, when in fact the Conservatives did do well in the North, or they did do, the Labour Party did do well in the South, but the electoral system doesn't allow that to come through. So the UK always looks a bit more disunited, um, in my opinion, because of the electoral system. Mm. Is it going to change? No, frankly. Um, I can't see it changing for the, for the House of Commons anytime soon. Maybe we'll go back to PR for mayors. Mm. Maybe there'll be electoral change in local government where everyone's a winner if that happens but the electoral system for the house of commons changing not a chance not with a landslide majority like this for the labor party no, I'm, I'm totally with you and i'm going to ask the same question to you to, to lisa claire but before that the, the arrival of 
reform uh, with its five MPs uh, out of 650. Similar similar in size to the DUP, for example. Yeah. I think seat more, seat, they're the same, in fact. What's it going to um, do to British politics, if anything? OK, it, it does give Nigel Farage a platform that he's been lacking since he was in the European Parliament. Um, it does, however, mean that he's now stuck in Britain. He can't really go off campaigning in the United States, as he was planning to do. Those five reform MPs are going to be probably just about coherent enough to not be dysfunctional. One of the things that people warned or kind of thought might happen is if, if reform won about 15 MPs, well, how many would have been sacked, resigned or convicted by the next election? Because if you look at how UKIP did in the European Parliament, it was a very dysfunctional body. So those five MPs, probably just enough to hold together. Are they big enough? to perform the reverse takeover of some have been talking about of the Conservative Party. Well, the Conservative Party did better than expected, still did very badly. Um, and the right of the Conservative Party, if people have been picking over the pieces of what's left of the Conservative Party, the right in the Tory party did a lot worse. There's actually a, a lot more of the left or the liberal side of the Conservative Party that have survived. So there could be a real fight um, on, on the form's hand over the next few years if they try to kind of push more on the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party might push back more than, than we were expecting. But with five MPs, they're here, they're going to be making a lot of noise, the media are going to be obsessed with them, more so than the Green Party to some extent, um, you know, fairly or not. And Nigel Farage has now been giving a new platform on which to push a much more populist campaign. Whether we can win in future, however, again, comes down to the electoral system. Reform don't have that focus and discipline that the Liberal Democrats have been able to deliver in this election, that Labour have in the past, and the Conservatives have been able to do. Can reform get its act together and do that in future and work with the electoral system? Well, we'll have to see, I suppose. I, I'm, I'm not confident, personally. I, I remember I was around the European Parliament and I was wondering if you'd mentioned that when, uh, as UKIP grew, it became very difficult to to hold it together and anything, anything you, could, you could call coherent. So... Five feels like if you can fit in a taxi, you can probably you can probably manage. But um, very interesting observations, Lisa Clare. Do you want to share anything in in the same tack, and also so I don't so I don't interrupt you. Uh, anything to say just about um, similar movements in the north? Obviously, with the arrival of a new kid on the block in Westminster politics, the TUV. And any thoughts to share? Yes. Um. So I agree. Um. With what Tim was saying, and I was just thinking through on the electoral system discussion i'm also 100 percent an advocate of reform but i also truly do not expect it to come anytime soon and um, not least given that the labor party has just um gained a landslide victory on the basis of minimal vote share change and that in itself tells you all you need to all you need to know um perhaps but i do think there's something interesting when we look at the vote share discrepancies as to in the medium term how that affects results in devolved elections and in local elections um, across the UK in future. So the reform versus Lib Dems is like a really good example, I think, to make the point where you have the Lib Dems who are very well organised and embedded at a local level. They are ruthlessly strategic when it comes to operating a first-past-the-post system with their minimal resources. And they have achieved, um, I think, yeah, 12% vote share and 11% of the seats versus reform, much newer party, much less embedded, don't have a strong, um, comparatively strong local election representation, and they're on 14% of the vote share and 1% of the seat representation. The question is then begged, where does reform go from here in terms of local and devolved representation? And can they um, pull together and become a, a significant force or are they more on the level of sort of strong mouthpiece and um, protest uh, voice in the um, UK landscape. And I think that also then speaks to what that Nigel Farage and reform um, representation in Westminster does depends, I would suggest, more on how the Conservative Party reacts to them than necessarily what is said, as we can sort of expect what will be put forward. Um, I can see Tim's going to say. I see Tim wanted to get in, and, and say, yeah. I, I want you to spark off each other. So Tim, please. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Go, go ahead. It's just I, I have something to add. So can okay. Go. Perfect. I'll quickly say that I think um, you could you can make a parallel for the um, 
Northern Ireland situation in terms of the TUV now being in Westminster. Um, and so Jim Allister will be, uh, he will be a strong voice as he has been in the Assembly for years and years. But what will determine its impact more broadly, I think, is how the other unionist representatives in Westminster for Northern Ireland respond to that and whether or not, because we one of the big takeaways from Northern Ireland is the splitting of the unionist vote. Um, and that's interesting in our history because there's been um, such a strong narrative of unionist solidarity from way back, I mean, 1920s is where you could go to get the origins for that. And so how from this point forward in the Westminster setting, the new diversity of unionist voices plays out, both in terms of um, the sort of presentation of what unionism is to the rest of the UK, that that's going to change because up until this point, we've had a very um, strong and sole uh, DUP voice over the last few years since yep. the loss of Sylvia Herman, but also what that does to more local politics in Northern Ireland in terms of being able to unite the vote. But it's that sort of the more extreme voice. Its significance, I think, is determined by how others respond to it um, that are in the similar part of uh, the electoral spectrum. What, what, what more Tim comes in, Lisa, could, you, could I just push it to answer your own question a little bit if you feel comfortable to do so in terms of the options at, at local level i think what you raise is extremely interesting regarding the reform party and indeed regarding political unionism in the north what are the what are the options exactly like which which ways could it go without having to um you know place a bet what, what are the possibilities so i think in the northern ireland setting there is a possibility that the dup look at the um, spread of the vote and the results and opt to take more extreme position on specifically our sea border issues than they have done in view of the TV support and even to an extent Alex Easton coming in. Um, but I would, that's option number one, but I actually think option number two is the more likely in the Northern Ireland setting whereby you don't have the DUP going too far in that down that extreme because I think of the broader picture of the new stability that we have in post in the post general election under Stormer government majority um, and a sense that if devolution can be made to work in Northern Ireland there could be quite immediate and um, clear immediate benefits for the people more broadly and I therefore think the DUP under Gavin Robinson will take more of a pro devolution and may use some uh, sort of negotiating lines around the impact of our sea border and the future of Northern Ireland, but won't take it to collapsing the executive. Essentially, I think that's been disincentivized by this electoral result. So. Really clear as ever, Lisa Clare. You're, you're always, you're, you're one of the, the best in the game at uh, explaining the complexities of, of, of the politics of Northern Ireland in a way that uh, anybody, including I, can, can understand the nuances of. So really clear. Thanks a million. Tim, you wanted to say something and then I have one question for you both, then we're going to get into the questions. It's about reform. One of the big temptations, especially within some parts of the Conservative Party, will, think, will be to think reform equals disgruntled Tory voters when actually reform gathered a lot of votes, not just from the Tory party, but from Labour as well and others, um, but mainly from the Conservatives, but Labour as well. So this idea of if only reform had not been there, the, La the Conservatives might not have lost. Even if you take reform out, according to those who've run the numbers, Labour still have a big majority. So reform not standing wouldn't have changed the overall result of a Labour victory. It might have reduced the, um, the actual kind of um, um, scale of the victory. But this temptation to think in the Conservative Party, especially, and I know one of the questions is, where does the Tory party go now? If the Tory party just thinks we just need to follow reform, that's not necessarily going to work. Nor for the Labour Party will it work to think, think that the Reform Party is just a threat to the Conservatives. They're not. They're also a threat to the Labour Party. One thing that is noticeable about this election, one of the big takeaways, is how willing people are to shop around with their vote that they're not as loyal to the Conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrats, SNP, um, as you might have expected in the past. Mm. And that's that's not going to change. I think that's a really interesting thing. And it was observed in Ireland recently also in our local and European elections, second order elections that took place last month. The uh, electoral volatility is just, just remarkable. It's been recorded across Europe. And indeed, what you're saying as well about the, the options facing the, the mainstream parties from challenger parties, 
this is an ancient thing in politics, but whether you, you ape them, you copy them, you avoid them, you know, these are the, the, the Tories have, have um, specifically the Tories, but indeed the Labour Party as well, also had to contend with this in recent history with the rise of UKIP, right? So what happens yeah. with, with reform is super interesting. I'm going to put one question to you as both. And then the other things I wanted to tease out, I'm very pleased that there's a, a veritable flood of questions that have come in, which I'm going to turn to, and they pick up some of the themes I wanted to raise with you. But I want to end this part of the discussion with a broad question, first with Tim, then to Lisa. Could you say anything, Tim, just about the formation of the cabinet? Is there anything that strikes you? Like, from my observing it with, with great interest, there was no enormous surprises, but maybe I'm unaware of some nuance. And also, second part of the of the question, what do you think this new cabinet means for the UK's relationship with its neighbourhood, with Ireland, its nearest neighbour, and indeed the rest of the world? So cabinet and a bit on foreign policy, Tim. Um, on the cabinet, yes, you're right. There's no, there's no real surprises. The the only one was Emily Thornberry um, being left out of the cabinet, but otherwise, it fell pretty much as we we as everybody expected. And I think Starmer had created such a disciplined team for the election; it would have been foolish to to cast them aside mm. as they entered Downing Street. One thing which is noticeable, of course, is that they weren't as prepared as previous governments because, okay. The civil service does begin negotiations and um, discussions with the uh, the official opposition in the run up to an election. We we're expecting that to be a bit longer, um, so Labour have had to hit the ground a bit you know harder than than, than you know, landing um, than they would have if the election had been the autumn. They've got straight to work. That's not just um, Starmer trying to put on a show. I think that's Starmer's work mentality anyway. He's a bit of a workaholic, yeah. so he's not going to be um, sitting around. In terms of I suppose we can come on to one issue later on, whether or not the super majority, as people have described it, means that this is going to be an extremely powerful authoritarian government and so forth. You don't need a super majority to do that in the UK. You need just a comfortable majority in the House of Commons. Actually having that big majority in the House of Commons could be a bit of a difficulty for Starmer and his cabinet because there's now really the biggest opposition, as usual, comes from the from the backbenchers, and it certainly is going to come from the backbenchers in this government, with large numbers of MPs who, well, many of them won't don't think they'll be here for very long, and they didn't expect to be here, uh, large numbers of them either, quite so soon. But when it comes to relations with the with Britain's neighbours, and especially with the European Union, Starmer has been very clear, Labour has been very clear, there will not be any negotiations over rejoining the single market or the customs union. There will not be any free movement discussions. There will be technical changes on things to do with veterinary agreements and perhaps on youth movement. There'll be a security and defence agreement, certainly. More than anything, I think the EU itself won't be willing to agree to anything with the UK until it sees what type of government this is. And also, looking further ahead, from the EU's perspective, this can't be just about negotiating with the Labour government of one term. It needs to see what's going to happen with the Tory party. If the Tory party does go further to the right, starts aping more of reform's agenda, does start campaigning even more ruthlessly on withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights, which obviously causes problems for Northern Ireland, then the EU is going to back off because, OK, Labour is safe for this government. But let's not forget, 1945, Clement Attlee wins a massive landslide election result and he's gone by 1951. Um, it could easily be that this government is we're back to a hung parliament or a Tory government within five, 10 years. I, I'm not ruling that out. But from, a Labour, from the EU's perspective, if you want to have close relations with the UK, you need to see that the whole system has changed. And that's not going to happen quick. One reason why it might take longer, also from a UK perspective, is just good old demographics. Leave voters are dying off. Remain voters are much younger. They're coming through. But that's not going to happen overnight either. And it's not going to happen by the end of this parliament. You're looking 10, 15 years before that has a serious effect on, on British um, electoral politics. And even then, I have my doubts. Um, I'm worried that some people in Britain, especially younger voters, might be starting to romanticise relations with the European Union, that if we were in the European Union, we wouldn't have these problems, just like Eurosceptics romanticise leaving. Mm -hmm. And as anybody who's negotiated with the European Union knows, the EU puts itself first and can be a very ruthless, blunt negotiator. And I think the Labour government is going to have some challenges over the next few years in explaining to some of its voters who are very pro-European why it can't negotiate something with the EU because the EU is not going to buy it. Um, even if 
people in Britain want that. Um, it, you know, the EU is going to put itself first. You preempted a few questions there, actually, regarding the EU, Tim. Thanks a million. Lisa, I know you're you're chapping at the bit to come in. What do you think? Um, so I, just on the um, EU relations, I think specifically on the, the veterinary agreement um, that Labour has been very clear, they want to negotiate and um, at the same time, clear on not joining single market, customs union, etc. I think there is... It's not insurmountable, but this is a difficult challenge and prospect for the Labour government, not least because the EU have said, and based on precedent in their external relations, that any veterinary agreement will require alignment. And that means Court of Justice of the EU having jurisdiction to some extent um, from their perspective. And politically for Labour, while you could see the... Um, business case for doing a sort of narrow fix in terms of alignment on particular issues to make flow of agri-food goods work better. At the same time, to raise that in the House of Commons when you have Nigel Farage on opposing benches around being rule taker from the EU, um, it's just going to be it's going to be a political um, challenge and. There is also just then the process of it in terms of the EU's capacity and willingness to enter into in-depth negotiations. I think from the Labour side, they'll want something like a quick fix. Um, you could see a transitional sort of setup, um, but there's there's also sort of challenges in domestic law because of what because the legacy of the previous government around the Retained EU Law Act, which wholesale removed um, EU general principles, yeah. which fits with Brexit, of course, it's like the progression. But then if the Labour Party want to put that back in to an extent for the purposes of implementing a an alignment set up for veterinary um, goods and SPS agreement, that again, it's the politics of that and it's weighing up um, the technical regulatory um, benefit with political risks of engaging in a whole new set of negotiations. Obviously, from a Northern Ireland perspective, Everyone is on board for an SBS and veterinary agreement with the EU because that makes the IRC border less visible. But as Tim was also saying, the EU is changing um, and what comes through in terms of the new uh, commission will be important as um, from a UK perspective because nearest neighbour based trading partners and also within the politics, intergovernmental politics of the UK, because in particular Scotland and its policy, the Scottish government's policy to align with EU um, by default where appropriate, that's really politically strong in the context of a deregulatory conservative UK government started under Johnson. Um, but when it's a Labour Party that's seeking more alignment and that it's maybe a bit more nuanced when it comes to external relations and trade relations with the EU, um, I think the picture becomes messier. I could talk on and on about that. Could. Jump in. I wish you could. But you're making me think of something, um, at least Claire, that I'm from speaking with peers, so other think tanks across across Europe and beyond that we talk about, there's there's this kind of a sense of expectation that this new government, uh, given the fact that it doesn't have the same baggage as the last one has for the past 14 years, and just kind of Starmer's nature of being a bit more managerial, a bit more pragmatic, there is a sense that hopefully some of the kind of most, I don't know, the, the, the trickiest bits of politics we all remember, we still all wake up uh, in cold sweat thinking of the indicative votes in 2018, 19, whenever it was, for example, that, you know, just the fact that, you know, there's a different tone being set, even in the early days of this government, there's a bit of an expectation that things may be easier when it comes to SPS and other really important but administrative matters. I'm going to go to the questions, Lisa Clare, but I want to ask you first if you have anything to say, and you can say you don't, just on the composition of the new cabinet. There was no great surprise who the Sosny, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland is, um, mm -hmm. but do you, uh, anything to say on Hillary Ben's appointment or anything else regarding the cabinet? Um, nothing much to say, just on um, Hillary Ben's sort of remaining in post. I think that's a very positive indicator. And um, even just uh, the Prime Minister was in Belfast this week as well. And all of the language coming in terms of the relationship between central government and the Northern Ireland executive is is very positive. And, and I would say overall, I mean, 
not to understate the um, benefit of a sort of positive and constructive approach to dealing with Northern Ireland in particular coming from Westminster that that is not something that's been more contested for the last few years so um, that is to be welcomed it also obviously will come with expectation management in terms of delivery um, but the, the, the Prime Minister as we need to start calling him of course um, Prime Minister Starmer often cites his experiences in Northern Ireland where you can correct the exact term, but he was an advisor to the police board, I think, on human rights matters, Lisa Clare. Um, I don't know whether that's him sincerely saying one of the reasons I got into politics was my was the experiences I had there, or was he just trying to create a narrative for himself as a national politician? Do you, do you have a sense on, on how meaningful his engagement with, with Northern Ireland has been? I can speak to his early experiences in terms of motivation into politics, but I do know that um, his engagements when he's been here over the last few years has been that the reputation is that he is he's well versed. Um, he is uh, aware of some of the just basic challenges and and necessary nuances that you need to have sometimes when it comes to Northern Ireland discussions and and debates and understanding from different perspectives. So I really do think that's a, a very valuable asset for him engaging as Prime Minister for Northern Ireland because it like a lack of institutional knowledge has been something that has been difficult over the last few years, particularly. Um, so I do think there's a there's a realness of um, his uh, sentiment and understanding and experience of Northern Ireland. And we see that in particular in terms of, of how that plays out or impacts on policy. The position on the Legacy Act um, is notable and there has been a commitment to get rid of the effect of amnesty. So we'll see if and when that comes through. And also around um, just a, a niche Northern Ireland one, but everything to do with Casement Park at present and all of the associated challenges is something that requires that understanding of where the different positionalities are coming from and to navigate that, that it isn't just a budget issue to fix. And I think Hillary Benn is well placed to do that under Stormer's leadership. So um, we'll see how we go, but it looks looks pos more positive than it has been for a long time. Hillary Benn, Casement Park, as I heard it dubbed recently by somebody, if uh, if it does come, uh, come to fruition. 